Well, good morning to you. Uh, it's our second week of meeting online. This week, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 19. Let me just read that out, then we'll pray and we'll jump into God's Word. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we thank you that we are able to study God's word. And we pray that as we do so now, Lord, by your spirit, you would open it up to us. Help us to understand it clearly and truly as you intended it to be understood, Lord. Uh, help us not simply to understand its meaning, but to take its meaning to heart. That, it, uh, that this word, Lord, your word might transform our lives for your glory. Uh, that we might be part of the heavens that declare your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, just looking out of my window today, it's been absolutely beautiful, hasn't it? And for the past few days it has. The tulips are coming up in the pots in our back garden and the sun's streamed in through the window all day. It's a very real blessing from God as we get used to a new way of doing things. And this morning we're looking at Psalm 19, a wonderful Psalm of David that is full of wonder. David seems to have looked out of the window in the morning and heard the birds singing or seen a tremendous sunset or watched the flowers come out after the rains and it's turned into praise. This is a praise of creation but not praise for creation. So his praise floods out of him and it floods out for God. Not creation or created but creator. He's the one whose handiwork the heavens declare. He's the one the skies proclaim. Day after day, as sunrise follows sunset and another day begins, as sunset follows sunrise and we gain another glimpse through the night sky into that staggeringly beautiful and mind-blowingly massive cosmos that surrounds this life-supporting blue marble, Day after day, night after night, creation declares and proclaims and shouts from the rooftops the glory of God through the work of his hands. Verses 3 to 4. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. It's not that creation is covered with writing. You can't read it like a book. And it isn't that creation speaks English or any other human language for that matter. But we react to it. 
It provokes a response in us. There are few people who could visit a massive waterfall and not be in awe of the power. Few people who could witness a beautiful sunset and not marvel at the colours. Creation speaks. It communicates with the core of who we are. No one is beyond the impact of creation. No one can claim they've never heard creation's testimony of its creator. It speaks to the ends of the world. And so that includes us. So many cultures throughout history have worshipped the sun or nature. But the psalmist wants to show that even this is created, not creator. And if that's the case, how much greater must God be? Humanity has fallen into two traps again and again at this point. We've either worshipped creation in its many forms, whether the sun or the moon or the seasons, or perhaps in modern time, the skill of God's created people, pop stars and politicians, or the intelligence and creativity and ambition of God's created people, ideologies and rationales, with atheism and secularism and capitalism, We've fallen into this trap all too often. And when we've tried to avoid them, we've fallen into the opposite trap of claiming that creation is simply atoms bumping into each other. That it's meaningless, it's pure chance, it's of no significance. So many cultures worship the sun or nature, but the psalmist wants to show that even this is created, not the creator. And that being the case, as we've already said, how much greater must God be? The handiwork of God is clear to see. It's right in front of us. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, clearly knows Psalm 19 because he quotes it in chapter 10. But before he does, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, he says this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what's been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul is recognising human nature. He's saying, look, if you end up stood before God, as we all will do one day, and you say to God, oh, creation was pointing to you, was it? And we try to claim that we simply didn't hear it. Then God's response will be, yeah, you did. You just ignored it. And as any parent who's called out to their child and told them to switch off the telly will know, genuinely not hearing is a different thing to hearing and choosing to ignore. Paul says, we've all heard, and we've all rebelled and chosen our own course as well. We have no excuse. Creation's testimony has been poured out to each and every one of us. Creation's testimony condemns us. Creation, however, although it condemns us, it's powerless to save us. For that, we need something more than simply a knowledge of God. For that, we need to know God. And that's where David turns next in this psalm. Verses 7 to 14, where the first six verses of Psalm 19, David has used the language of God. Now in verse 7, he uses a different word. He uses the word of Lord, that is Yahweh that personal name of God. And David's point is very simple. You can know something about God through creation, that he's a glorious creator and we are his creation. But if you want a personal relationship with God, 
Well, then you need to meet with God in his word. The God who made himself known to his people personally as Yahweh. And what do we discover about this Lord as we get to know him through his word? Well, verses 7 to 9 give us six describing words, words that tell us about who he is. They tell us that the Lord is perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure and firm in the sense of being a firm foundation. David describes the effects of God's word as well. He tells us that God's words, this revelation of God, refreshes the soul, makes wise the simple, gives joy to the heart, gives light to the eyes. That last image, one of being able to see where before we couldn't. He, David describes how valuable the law is to him in verses 10 to 11. He says, they're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. As David dives deeper into scripture, it works on his heart and he becomes increasingly aware of just how broken he is. As he sees how great God is, he sees how far away from God's holy standard his life is. Verse 12, but who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless innocent of great transgression. David's humble and honest about his failings. He asks forgiveness for sins already committed, for strength and wisdom to keep from sinning in the future. This is true repentance, a turning round and an intention to walk with his God. David's understood that his Lord is a Lord you can ask to forgive you. A Lord who wants to forgive, who wants humility and honesty. Not a veneer of respectability. A Lord who wants to know us and for us to know him truly. David's understood that this Lord he's getting to know is not simply his help, but also his saviour his redeemer, his hope. Though Christ hasn't died yet for his sins, that will happen a thousand years later. King David is nonetheless trusting in that work to come. So he prays that his Lord's words would continue to be precious to him, that he would continue to live his life for God and by his wisdom, by repentance and faith. This is... David's desire, his prayer, and he prays just that as we can pray for ourselves now. Verse 14, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us through creation. Lord, there is no one, even those with no access to your word, who have any excuse for, for denying that you are the great creator, the divine God who has made all things and that your glory is evident through those things, through their intricacy and their beauty. So, Lord, we thank you and we thank you for this amazing weather we have at the moment that lifts our souls and speaks of your goodness, your goodness to your world. But, Lord, we thank you that you didn't stop there. You knew that we needed to know more than know about you. Lord, we needed to know you. We needed to know your love and your kindness. We needed to know your call to repentance. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have made available to us your scripture that reveals you. And even, Lord, as, as, uh, as your law condemns us, Lord, so your scriptures point us to the one who lived a perfect life, who is our rock and our redeemer.
the one who buys us back at great cost, that cost paid on the cross of Christ. And so, Lord, we can step out today in the knowledge that as we witness your glory, we realise that that glory is made available to us fully through the cross of Christ. Help us then, Lord, to dive into your scriptures, to recognise that as they point to Jesus Christ, the ultimate revelation of God, Lord, they are more precious than gold, more precious than the sweetest of honey. Lord, they are, they are uh, all that we could all that we could want. Help us then, Lord, even at this time where perhaps we have uh, more time than we expected to spend that time in the study of your scriptures, Lord. Open our eyes to your glory. Help us to rest in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And may God bless you this week.